Turn with me to the book of Galatians. The last few weeks we've been doing a, a series on the doctrine of justification by faith in Christ alone. We first looked at the doctrine, then the last two sermons we looked at various objections that have been raised against it. Uh, this week and next week we are going to wrap up that series and then go to our regular practice of preaching through a book systematically. But let's look at Galatians chapter 1 in verses 6 through 10 where we see really the importance of the gospel itself, the one true gospel being set forth. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I are trying to please man, I would not be the servant of Christ. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you would give us a deep commitment to the gospel itself, to the fact of the work of Jesus being the only way of our salvation, and the only name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. As I mentioned, the last few weeks we've been looking at this crucial doctrine of justification by faith in Christ alone. And you may remember we have observed that it is a legal work of God uh, whereby our, our sins are forgiven and we, they're pardoned in Christ. Uh, righteousness is imputed or credited to us and received by faith alone. Uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism summarizes it that justification is an act of God's free grace. By saying act, it means it's, a, it's in a moment, it's a, that legal declaration, the moment a person believes, wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us as righteous in his sight, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. And really any group or church or person that compromises this doctrine is essentially attacking the heart of the gospel. And Paul was deeply concerned about this in regard to the Galatians. His epistle to the Galatians is a strong defense of the doctrine against the teaching of the Judaizers. In fact, the whole book is passionate and strong in this regard. Uh, the Judaizers were a group that were holding that you can believe in Jesus, but in order to really be saved, you have to be circumcised, you have to keep all the external ceremonial aspects of the law. So they are adding that to faith in Christ. And this is really a striking and unusual portion in Paul's writings. As you read through Paul's epistles, you've probably noticed that they are filled with exhortations to be kind to one another, to love one another, to extend mercy to one another, uh, to not be a stumbling block to another Christian, all those types of things. Think of 1 Corinthians 13, that whole chapter dealing with the aspect of Christian love. In fact, next week we're going to look at a, the little book of Philemon, and see an example of this in very vivid terms, in terms of Christian uh, mercy and compassion and that type of thing, as well as I think a good illustration of our justification. But when you look at this passage, it's very striking because Paul throughout, in fact throughout the whole book of Galatians, um, is borders on vehemence. He had a deep concern for the peace in Christ's church, but here he is extremely passionate about the gospel itself. 
He's addressing the fact that the Galatians are being seduced and pulled away from the truth of the gospel. Now the Judaizers had come into the area. They apparently had confused many of them. Some of their teaching had been embraced. And apparently some people in the Galatian church and area were confused, were forsaking the truth of gospel that they had received, and were accepting the teaching that mixed works and grace together. And first we see that Paul expresses an amazement at their departure from the true gospel. In verse 6 he says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. He goes on to say, not that there is another one. He says, no, there's no other gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. He says he's amazed. In fact, the word he uses, thanamazo in Greek, is a strong word. It's often used to describe people's reactions when they witnessed a miracle. And they're amazed at one of the miracles of Jesus. And Paul's astonished. How is it possible that these people, who once heard the best news that could ever be proclaimed to anyone, and received it with great joy, uh, the promise of the heaven itself, all the future glory of God's people, they heard that wonderful news that they were forgiven for their sins and completely accepted by God. How was it now they're turning away from that to something else? I remember hearing a testimony of the man years ago who had come to the Lord and he was so overjoyed. It was an evening service and as he was walking home he was literally jumping up in the air and kicking his heels and jumping over fire plugs because he was so happy about his new salvation that he had just experienced. Well, you could think about probably that type of response among some of these people. Now they were being seduced by the Judaizers to have the reliance on their own obedience, aspects of the works of the law, as a basis of their salvation. And while they began trusting in the merit of Christ alone for their salvation, now they are moving away from that trust to partly trusting in Christ and partly trusting in their own obedience or merit. And Paul is saying, don't you understand what you're leaving? You're not leaving a philosophy. You're not turning away from some just theological point. You're turning away from Christ himself. From him who is the gospel, who alone has purchased your salvation. Now the error of the Judaizers is really the doctrine of sinful man. It is prevalent in our culture today. A large number of people say they believe uh, in a God of some type and they're safe before God because they've been good or they've been church members, they've been baptized, they've given to charity. The list of things people say they've done goes on and on and on. In fact, through the years in doing evangelism calls on people, you'd be amazed at some, how some people memorize a list of things they've done. I can remember a lady one time going through a whole litany saying it almost as fast as she could. She obviously rehearsed it in her mind. I've, I've given to charity. I've given blood. I've done this thing. I've done that. I get clothes with the clothing dry. Da, 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 da. I served in this nursing home. And just went on and on and on and on. And I remember thinking, well, I get the point. That's what you're trusting in. <laughs> well, that is the doctrine of fallen sinful man. And you cannot mix grace and your own works as a basis of salvation. When I was a very little boy, uh, I think under five years old, we had a Doberman in our home named Toby. And Toby had one raison d'etre, and that was to kill every cat in the world. <laughs> and uh, cats and Toby could not coexist. I think now I have a, nice, a dog, a cat lies right down next to him. And in fact, with my daughter's great dame, one cat will just lie down right in the crook of his neck without any fear. Uh, that wouldn't happen with Toby. Uh, in fact, one time a skunk got in the yard, and that was just a foul smelling cat. And it got under the doghouse, and he dug it out. Of course, it sprained him and sprained him. 
and this is in the days before air conditioning, and you know the skunk smell just permeated the neighborhood. And I can remember my father particularly working on the dog with baths, what was it, tomato juice and all that, trying to get it off. But uh, Toby and cats were incompatible. Well, in the same way, grace and works are incompatible in terms of trusting works for our salvation. And Paul says that a different gospel, something that adds works to belief in Christ alone, is no gospel. Of course, the ultimate question is, do you trust in anything in yourself for salvation? If you do, Paul's writing to you. There is only one way of salvation, and that is through faith in Christ alone, through a reliant trust in Him. Well, Paul then rebukes them for their departure from the true gospel, and gives a very strong apostolic warning. In verse 8, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. It's almost like then he would say, maybe you didn't quite get it. Let me say it again. Verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. This is the strongest and most serious rebuke Paul ever makes in any of his writings. He doesn't spell out anyone. But in Galatians 2, he mentions he even had to rebuke Peter, who was defecting on this issue. Paul essentially says, I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's Gabriel coming down from heaven. I don't care if a, some angel comes down or another prophet comes down or any of the apostles teach another gospel. If they do, let them be accursed. And the word he uses there is anathema. Cursed, marked through destruction, under the damnation of God. Now this isn't some reactionary just railing about something. This is the Apostle Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, saying that anyone preaches a different message of salvation, let him come under the anathema of God. He says, let him be damned. What does he say next? He says, he says, I just emphasize it. We are an angel from heaven. Anyone preached you a gospel, let him be accursed. In Luther's little book, The Bondage of the Will, he is answering a work called The Diatribe by Erasmus, Desiderius Erasmus. Erasmus had written against the Reformation. Uh, it's, it's interesting, Erasmus had done great textual work on the New Testament. Uh, he had called for a real piety and, a, and written against the corruption in the medieval church. Uh, some historians have said that Erasmus laid the egg and Luther hatched it <laughs> in that way. But as the Reformation began to take off, Erasmus backed off and opposed the doctrines that were, take, that were being set forth. And the, his work, The Diatribe, is especially against that. But at one point in the book, Luther thanks Erasmus. He said, I thank you, dear Erasmus, that you haven't bothered me with trifles. And so often Christians do fight over petty issues, trivial matters. And Luther said he didn't want to fight over some little nothing, some petty issue. He said, but over the issue of how a person is saved. Or the issue of justification. He called it the doctrine on which the church stands or falls. He said there can be no negotiation. And Paul mentions that we are an angel from heaven. In Galatians 2, he mentions he had to stand against Peter. Look in Galatians 2 at chapter 11, or ch uh, chapter, verse, chapter 2, verse 11, get it out. But when Cephas, Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. 
So before certain men came from James, being from Jerusalem church, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though being a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. We also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. Notice in verse 16, three times he says we're not justified by the works of the law. Three times he says we're justified through believing in Christ. He said, I even had to stand against Peter on this. And then in verse 21 of Galatians 2, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. If you can be saved by your own works, by your own righteousness, Christ died for no purpose. His death was unnecessary. In fact, all through the book you see this same passion. Looking now in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was both for your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing through faith? Basically he says, you stupid idiots. <laughs> How were you saved? It wasn't through the works of the law. It was through faith in Christ. So this is the gospel. And this is what Paul says can never be distorted or changed. The corruption of this truth is under the curse of God. The person or an angel teaches something contrary to this. Paul says, let them be damned. Of course, this calls us to examine our own hearts. What do you believe concerning salvation? Do you trust in Christ alone, or do you trust in your own works and performance? Do you mix performance, your own works, and faith together? If you do, you're not in a state of grace. You're not saved. In Galatians chapter 3 and verses 10 and following, it says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be every one who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. If you're going to be saved by your own works, you have to be absolutely perfect. You have to keep every nuance of the law. And that includes not only the external actions, but every attitude of the heart associated with it. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, You've heard it said, You shall not commit adultery, but if you lust after a woman in your heart, you have violated the commandment. Heard it said, Don't commit murder. You hold that anger, bitterness in your heart towards someone. You violated that commandment. In the musical Sound of Music, and I, I love the musical, uh, don't want to get me wrong in this illustration, but. Uh, when Maria, you know, played by Julie Andrews, realizes that the captain, Christopher Plummer's character, is in love with her. Remember the song that she breaks into? Nothing comes from nothing, nothing other could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. Well, you know, I've earned it. <laughs> so, you know, great music and the sound of music, wonderful singing and all those things, but those words are not quite right, are they? <laughs> And um, there are myriads of applications of Paul's rebuke and warning. Of course, one big application is personally, do we trust in anything in ourselves and not in Christ alone? 
If we do, we're called upon to renounce that and transfer trust to Jesus. But also in terms of liberal theology, uh, it comes under this same judgment. Liberal theology claims to have a connection with historic Christianity, while at the same time it denies the inspiration of scriptures, the virgin birth of Christ, the miracles of Jesus, Christ's work of the atonement, and His resurrection. But we're Christians. <laughs> And of course they deny justification by faith in Christ alone because it really doesn't matter what you believe in order to go to heaven. Of course anyone who holds those tenets or is under Paul's anathema that he mentions the anathema of God. This also applies to the cults who deny the deity of Jesus or add some kind of the works uh, to gain favor with God. It applies to any church or denomination that teaches anything contrary to justification by faith in Christ alone. And of course it applies to you personally if you trust in any way on your own performance or good works or salvation. Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century uh, preacher said, any church which puts in place a justification by faith in Christ alone, another method of salvation, is a harlot church. It's always very pithy in the way he said things. <laughs> we also see in Galatians 1 in this first section we read in verse, verse 10 that Paul says we are never to compromise the one true gospel for the sake of the ecclesiastical or personal relationships. So am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul was willing to risk every human relationship that he enjoyed rather than compromise through one second the gospel of Christ. In the 16th century, time of the Reformation, the the visible church was ruptured and shattered into literally thousands of pieces over the question of what is the gospel. Remember on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the castle door church at Wittenberg. It wasn't an act of defiance, that was the public bulletin board. And he was calling for a debate on the issue of the sale of indulgences where people could buy an indulgence and secure their place in heaven or even get um, lost relatives or at least relatives in purgatory as the, the false doctrine taught out of purgatory, get them into heaven. And he called for a debate on that. It very quickly moved into a debate on what is the basis of authority and the scriptures alone and how are we saved in terms of justification? Well, there were those around Luther who told him to back down. Uh, they said, Martin, you know, it really is not that important. Um, back down, you're being too rigid. Uh, Luther said, it's not my cause. It's the cause of Christ. It's the cause of salvation and the souls of people. I can't back down. You hear a lot of people today talk about a pluralism of truth and it really doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. The Bible doesn't present it that way. It presents one true gospel. In the Roman Catholic response to the Reformation, the Council of Trent, there was a council that met between uh, 1545 and 1563 on and off. There were some conflicts going on in Europe and couldn't meet all the time. But particularly in the sixth session, which met in 1547, it produced 33 canons on justification. And each one began with a formula. It said, if anyone says, and then something would be there that someone could say. And it would always end with, let them be anathema. 
they took the language from Galatians 1. And here, just some of them get a, just a sense of it. If, one, if anyone saith that justifying faith is nothing else but confidence in the, in the divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, or if this confidence alone is that whereby we are justified, let him be anathema. In other words, if you believe in Christ alone for your salvation, let you be cursed. That's what they were saying. They said, if anyone says that it is necessary for everyone for obtaining the remission of sins, that he believe for certain and without any wavering arising from his own infirmity and disposition, that his sins are forgiven him, let it be anathema. For if anyone believes that he truly is forgiven through faith in Christ, let him be anathema. If anyone saith that justice received is not preserved and also increased before God through good works, but that the said good works are merely the fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause and increase of it, let him be anathema. In other words, we do talk about our works flowing out of our being justified, but they don't contribute to our justification. If anyone says that, they said, let them be anathema, let them be damned. Now, tragically, what they did was repudiate the biblical teaching of salvation, formally and officially. And then at the end of the whole document, they placed an anathema on anyone who changed anything they ever said. And the 1994 Catechism of the Catholic Church reiterates the same thing. R.C. Sproul said there, he said, there is something I can appreciate about that. At least they had the courage of their convictions. They believed that the reformers were wrong. And they believed they had the true gospel. And therefore, they stood by their convictions and placed the reformers under their anathema. He said, if they were right, we are under the anathema of God. However, the Reformers and Protestants down since then, many different groups have been preaching the biblical gospel. And tragically, they repudiated the scriptural gospel. They turned away from that. Now, there are those inside the Roman Catholic Communion, individual people in the pews, that believe in Jesus through their salvation in spite of the official doctrine. Don't want to be misunderstood on that. But since the, and since the middle of the 19th century, there has been, in some of the most, been some of the most dramatic compromises and negotiations of the truth of the gospel in church history. In the first half of the 20th century, a large percentage of mainline churches denied almost every essential truth of the faith. In recent years, there have been many arguments on the issue of justification by faith in Christ. One theologian said it this way, people are willing to affirm truth, but they aren't willing to call the opposite position false. Not willing to speak out against it. Paul says that there is one true gospel and it matters. It matters eternally. It matters broadly in terms of the proclamation of the gospel, and it matters in terms of your life and your soul before God. If you're believing in and holding to anything else other than faith in Jesus, this anathema Paul proclaims applies to you. And the call of the gospel, the command of the gospel, is to renounce any self-help effort, any trust in yourself, and throw all of yourself on Jesus and Him alone for salvation. Trust in Him and the one true gospel through faith in Him and the promise of God is that you will truly be forgiven and accepted before God as righteous because of Christ's perfect righteousness credited to you. Let's pray.
Father, we are grateful for the grace of God that is given to us in Jesus. We thank you that in his life and his death, his resurrection, he accomplished everything necessary for our salvation. We affirm again that our only hope of salvation is through Jesus. And we thank you for your great and magnificent promises to us that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name.